the there's five levels of uh, building, and it begins with professionalism. So professionalism is, for instance, not just being on time and looking professional, but it's being on time and 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 readiness when you're on time. Mm -hmm. uh, and then it moves into problem solving. Can you solve a problem on behalf of a client and actually see their problem as your own mm -hmm. uh, and solve it with that in mind? And then concierge. Can you now look around corners and anticipate even unspoken needs? Uh, then finally, uh, security. Can you can you think in terms of security, but not make that ultimate? And what we find is, is that these things, they stack on one another, but you can't forget the bottom layers when you're doing security. Professionalism yeah. still matters. Yeah. Uh, and then with that, um, we are consistently looking to through our network of a thousand cities, gain the best practices from each chauffeur and yeah. then share that as tips that everybody can use. That's an interesting question. Uh, so I would say that it was uh, usually a couple of war stories. My dad was an attorney, my mom was a teacher. Uh, and then there is maybe like one or two war stories from school. Mm -hmm. Um, but I would say that one thing we, we were characterized as, I would say a fast eating family. So the dinner table period didn't last too long. And, uh, my dad was one of five kids. So, um, I learned early, you kind of had to, you kind of had to go for the food or, or you wouldn't, you wouldn't have seconds. Yeah. Yeah. And, and do you think, did you get some of your entrepreneurial tendencies from your dad? Do you think? No, I think I got it more from my my granddad on my mom's side. Uh, okay. He was uh, he was a farmer, and I got to go around his farm and just see him solve problems creatively, with really no roadmap. And that that kind of was an inspiration for me. Oh, that's very cool! Very cool. And what was your first kind of your first foray into uh, uh, entrepreneurialism? Well, when I was a kid, I did baseball card collecting. And okay. I would start uh, a neighborhood baseball card show and uh, buying and selling and trading. Those were that was really my passion where I really love to do research and find avenues of maybe underpriced cards and things like that. Uh, very cool. I, I, I used to collect cards, too, and you have all your Beckett's and all that, you know, spread out all over the place. And yeah, those are those are great times. So what was, what was the best card that you ever uh found when you were a kid? You know, the, the best investment I ever made was uh, I bought a bunch of Nolan Ryan cards from the 70s and 80s, not rookies or anything. Yeah. But uh, I, I just kind of said, you know, I think Nolan Ryan's going to the Hall of Fame and I'll just buy that and hold that. And I think that's done better for me than anything else. Yeah. Very cool. Very cool. Yeah. I, I had a Jerry Rice rookie card, but it had a stain from the bubble gum on the back of it. But I was so proud of that thing. Um, and I, think, I think one of my friends ended up stealing it from me, if I remember correctly. But, uh, but yeah, I don't have it anymore. So, um, yeah. So, so um, what was what was uh, what was your path like growing up then? So did you go to college? Did you skip college and start something? What, what, what did that look like for you? So I went to college at Emory in Atlanta, uh, which is where they send people with Ebola. Uh, so <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's kind of a pre-med factory a little bit. But uh, I was a history and economics major. And uh, I was kind of trying to determine, you know, what I wanted to do. And uh, I kept on having these entrepreneurial ideas and a really formative experience for me at the end of my freshman year in college, I signed up to sell books door to door for a um, basically a college internship program called the Southwestern Company. Mm -hmm. And I hated it, but it exposed a lot in me that I felt like I had to refine and work on if I was going to be successful as an entrepreneur. Yeah. Uh, and so I came back, even though I hated it, uh, and did two more summers of it. And frankly, I kind of learned how to sell. I learned how to run a business. And that gave me the confidence to start something after college. Yeah. And what types of things do you feel were some of the big like aha moments in that, that learning? I think getting over the fear of rejection. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I had been able through academics to perform pretty well and kind of always build on maybe credentials or achievements I achieved in the past. But when you're knocking on a door in West Virginia, like they don't care about any of that. Um, yeah. And they'll slam the door on you and 
Uh, they don't care who you are, where you're from, what your GPA is or anything like that. And uh, it was really good for me to learn uh, getting over fear of rejection and frankly, just hard work. I think uh, I, I put in my book, the difference in giving 100% and 95% is, is everything. And that last 5%, I think, is the, the hardest to get out of you. Yeah. Yeah. Completely, completely agree. Yeah. And, and talk a little so, so did you start Fortis right away out of, out of college or is there other things that you did, you know, when you graduated? It was, uh, it was six months after I graduated, I started Fortis. So okay. uh, it's pretty much my only marketable skill. <laughs> and and uh, talk a little bit about what Fortis does and you know, why you pick that industry, why you pick that market to, to get into so Fortis does secure private travel for the world's most discerning travelers. Uh, and so typically that involves chauffeurs uh, in about a thousand cities around the world, uh, but it also involves security arrangements, even intel gathering. Um, but the, it wasn't my first pick for what I would do. Uh, we failed into it. Mm -hmm. And Fortis started as a prepaid taxi cab card for college students. Ah. And then when 9-11 happened, the market just completely went away and I started to sell these cards to companies and uh, you know, TSA had started in the wake of 9-11 and a lot of people were starting to charter aircraft mm -hmm. and they didn't have anybody to pick them up and they wanted black cars. And so we pivoted into that market in 2002 and that's really been the focus ever since. Wow. Wow. And, and did you have to go out and buy a fleet of cars? Is that how, how your, how your company works or is it uh, all like private individuals in different cities that you essentially contract with? Exactly. We've never, we've never had a fleet. We've never wanted to have a fleet. Yeah. Um, what we do is we uh, the secret sauce that we use is basically training people up into brand standards of performance mm -hmm. and then assessing them so that we can always kind of, make sure that we're using the best. Yeah. Interesting. So, so what does that training look like? I mean, is it, is it, you know, some type of coursework? Is it, you know, how to, how to, you know, serve another person? And obviously, you know, there's the security level there too. I mean, do they have to have some type of, you know, in law enforcement training, anything like that? I mean, I guess so it begins with, it begins with really professionalism. So somebody just wanting to enter into our network and then, we just basically do a check on them and their credentials and who vouches for them. And then we might send them some very basic rides that we have and evaluate that. Mm -hmm. um, as it increases, as somebody gets to be in our five-star system, more like a four or five star, then we start to say, we're going to really pour resources into you. Mm -hmm. uh, and that involves, we have conferences for our partners uh, we have a, a five-star conference that we only invite five-star chauffeurs to. Wow. Uh, and then with that, now we're really kind of teaching them the finer points. And then just to assess ourselves on that, we're consistently doing surveys with our clients to, uh, to make sure that we actually are, you know, performing to the standard that we set. Sure. Yeah. And, and what types of, um, I don't want to get into like all the, the nitty gritty type things, but I, I guess if, if you wanted to work for Fortis, um, what types of skills would I need to bring to the table? Or what types of identifiers do you look for in people um, that, that potentially could be a, a good hire? I'm just curious if there's anything like sort of low level, low hanging fruit that you would say, oh, yeah, you, you potentially could be a, a five star chauffeur. Sure. Uh, so. The, there's five levels of uh, building and it begins with professionalism. So professionalism is, for instance, not just being on time and looking professional, but it's being on time and, and, and readiness when you're on time. Mm -hmm. uh, and then it moves into problem solving. Can you solve a problem on behalf of a client and actually see their problem as your own mm -hmm. uh, and solve it with that in mind? And then concierge, can you now look around corners and anticipate even unspoken needs? Uh, then finally, uh, security. Can you, can you think in terms of security, but not make that ultimate? And what we find is, is that these things, they stack on one another, but you can't forget the bottom layers when you're doing security. Professionalism yeah. still matters. Yeah. Uh, and then with that, um, we are consistently looking to 
through our network of a thousand cities, gain the best practices from each chauffeur and yeah. then share that as tips that everybody can use. That's great. That's great. So how do you, how do you network everyone together? You know, so those, those things do share, I mean, you don't have 5,000 um, chauffeurs that are all on a zoom call together. Do you, or how, how does that trickle through? So, so the big thing for us, especially over the last five or six years has been Uber has been great for us because it's busted up the firmament. And I think a really broken industry. And so our ideal is that we go with what we call a partner shop, which is usually maybe three to 10 chauffeurs that are all kind of independent agents that have their own vehicle and their own insurance and those kinds of things. Um, And then within those shops, we pour a lot of resources into usually the the head guy is an owner chauffeur. Yeah. yeah. Uh, And then if he gets the template down, then he's kind of deputized to go and, and train his other guys in those methods too. Mm-hmm. And and speaking of the template, how did you guys how did you guys originally develop that? Is this based on any type of experiences that you that you've had or any type of trainings that maybe you guys have gone through? Um, like how how was that original uh, template developed? Well, I would say uh, the you know the book what rich clients want is basically based on they don't tell you what they want and you just have to do trial and error. uh, In our case, 21 years of it and and inferring a B testing. Do you like this more? Do you like this more? And then through that, we, we kind of figured out, I think the progression of how that, that happens. But I mean, I didn't come up with that in a vacuum, Uh, you know, just to give one uh, shout out. uh, If you know, Horst Schultz, uh, he's the, the Ritz Carlton, yeah. Uh, he also kind of sprinkled his stuff on Chick Fil A, and uh, I would say that a lot of our a lot of our methods are built on his chassis. Yeah, oh, that's that's interesting. I, and I I forgot all about that, and I I should go back and and revisit that. I was actually in a Ritz Carlton this this weekend in Beaver Creek. Um, we stayed there, so um, fantastic service. You know, that's you know kind of one of the standards, obviously. Um, so so you you mentioned your book, What Rich People Want, correct? That's uh, what rich clients want, but won't tell you. Yes. And I love that title. I love that title. Um, what, who is that written for? Is it, is it for, like written for a business um, who's looking to cater to rich people or, or who's the audience for that book? Well, I think it's, I think it's really two audiences primarily. So one is service providers. I think more and more are going to be doing work for uh, high net worth clients Mm -hmm. and understanding what they want. We've had so many meetings with service providers, chauffeurs or security, and they view it all as just random and arbitrary. And well, these guys can fire and hire whoever they want. And we've really had to systematically work with them to teach them. There is a method to this. These guys are all about ROI and they just buy and sell but they don't really have the time or the desire to coach you up into that. They just know how to identify it. And so I think the service providers, it's going to be helpful for them. We've also had the experience of showing it to our clients and their support teams, and it helps to demystify and put words to a lot of the things that they want, but even their support teams may not, may not have words for it. So I think it's both in the supply and demand side. Yeah. Interesting. Interesting. Um, what were, what are some of the, I guess, some of the, the things that you've included in the book that are, um, you know, sort of, I, I guess, you know, the, the top of the cream, the top of the, the, the things that you've learned over the, the years. Um, like, I, I guess, I guess where I'm going at, is it, is it like a tactical type approach? Are there, you know, different things that you can do to, you know, um, you know, make your service stand out or, or is it written more like in a, like a playbook type fashion? Explain a little bit about, about how you, how you put the, the book together. So I go through the levels, I call it the skyscraper of success because there's this penthouse and you're looking at the top of it and you're wondering, well, how do you get in there? Cause there's so much abundance and so much going on in there. And basically each bank of elevators takes you up to the next level and it begins with professionalism. So I guess the beginning stage of that, Matt, I would say is basically viewing what you do as a craft rather than a job. Mm-hmm. So the way that you do it is uniquely yours if you continue to hone it and refine it and make it a craft. 
and nobody would do it exactly the way you would do it if you see it as that. Yeah. If you see it as just a job, then you're clocking in, you're clocking out. Your job is to get somebody from point A to point B, and you'll never kind of even enter the skyscraper. Yeah, that makes that makes sense. So, what in your experience, what makes a uh, a a, a okay sh- chauffeur versus a, a great chauffeur? Is it is it the you know the fact you know they 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 get all five stars? I mean, I, actually, I guess you could even look at you know two five star um, chauffeurs, you know, I'm assuming that you can say that one person would stand out over the other one. Is there, are there, you know, fine little tweaks that you can make once you reach that top level to kind of, you know, make yourself stand out even further? Does that make sense? Yes. So, um, I guess, uh, maybe two part answer to that. So one interesting thing that we've uncovered over the years, I've had dinner with dozens of chauffeurs and I've kind of just reverse engineered, what is, what is it that makes them so good at this and so good at service? Mm -hmm. And the biggest common denominator I've seen is that they cut their teeth on service before they are 25 and and learn to delight in providing really good service. And some of that was, uh, I mean, there's a guy that was a a bellman at the Ritz Carlton. Uh, There's many of them that had big families that were kind of the neighborhood hangout spot and they were cooking meals for everybody in the neighborhood. Um, And so they have that passion that's there. So I would say that's the necessary part, right? And and that's, all of our five stars have that almost to to a person. Um, But then you still have to actually work at it and hone it. And that passion kind of fuels you through it of the trial and error. So, um, you know, what a five star does in Miami that I cite in the book versus you know, an elite person in Los Angeles, they may have different methods to that, but they both began with that passion for service. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Interesting. And do you guys use any type of um, profiling tests or anything like that to to be able to identify, you know, what, what sort of the underlying motivations and, and the way that, you know, people might respond to different things like a, like a disc test or anything like that. Do you, do you buy into any of those types of of approaches when you're looking for, for new chauffeurs, just again, kind of establish how they look at different situations or how they respond in different, different areas. Uh, we don't use that for chauffeurs. We use that a lot internally for our operations team. And I I am a believer in in testing, uh, in that regard, what is a great tool for us because we do the chauffeurs and we do the security and we have a lot of relationships with pilots is that we're always referencing people against other people because high performers are attracted to other high performers. Sure. Yeah. So if we had a, last year, we had a, a multi-month round the clock security job in Budapest and we were using the security people to evaluate the chauffeurs and give us feedback and coaching. And then vice versa, we were using the yeah. chauffeurs to tell us about the security. And this all happened right during the uh, beginning of the lockdown and we had our Parisian chauffeur, who was a five star, actually go and vet the team in Budapest because it was spun up on like a day or two notice. Yeah. So the vouch for system in terms of those service providers has proven the best for us. That's really interesting. So, so you're actually you're, you're taking proven five star uh, people and sending them in to evaluate, you know, the, the new teams or the, the new groups. Um, what are what are some of the common types of things that you uh what, what types of feedback do you typically get, you know, if, if I'm just, I'm just curious to, to hear how, you know, a five-star person would look at uh, a given, you know, situation. Is it, is it very much so, well, you know, they did this in this situation, you know, it should have been done this way, or is it more, I guess, constructive or, or um, understanding? I, I guess, I guess where I'm going with this is uh, a lot of times in, in my experience, someone may come in from the outside and they, they would, um, you know, sort of jump in and not necessarily have all the context behind whatever, you know, whatever that situation is and getting feedback from that person, you know, from that very high level without knowing all the context is, you know, you're going to get a high level explanation, but not necessarily all of the underlying, you know, information underneath there. Um, I guess the question is, do you, have you noticed, you know, the, the high achievers being able to identify, you know, situations and, and sort of understanding, 
I guess, understanding maybe the, the, the deeper story that might be present there without, um, by, by identifying it in a constructive way, rather than just sort of, again, identifying that one, that one little nugget or that one little situation and, you know, sort of calling that out as either a positive or negative um, in that, you know, in that, that one particular situation. Again, I don't, does that make sense? When you're saying high achievers, you're referring to our clients? Yeah, well, no. You, so, so like you said, like high achievers are attracted to other high achievers. And, and you know, so you, you have one high achiever that is going into a situation where, you know, you think there's other high achievers. And, you know, again, sort of evaluating their performance, evaluating how they um, are doing in any one particular situation. But by inserting that one guy and, <clears throat> excuse me, the high achiever uh, that you know, he's going to go in not necessarily have, having as much context as what the, you know, supposed, you know, new high achiever is going to have. So I'm just curious to, to, to if you have any, um, any experience or, or I guess frameworks for being able to identify when you have, you know, truly constructive um, feedback, or is it, you know, again, just someone sort of swooping in and, and, identifying a situation that may not necessarily have been the way handled the way that the you know known high achiever would handle it um but that known high achiever didn't necessarily know the entire story behind whatever you know whatever the 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 newcomer is does that does that make sense yes uh so i think i think a five star is going to want when he's evaluating somebody is going to want to test drive and put some pressure on the person and see how they respond to that. Mm -hmm. While at the same time, they're almost never a snob about, well, this is the only right way to do it. Um, so there is local context and local customs and local ways that things are done. And I think if those elements of professionalism, concierge security are there, they're actually uh, amazingly uh, humble about the way that you achieve those things. Mm -hmm. But if those elements aren't there, I think they would be very, uh, you know, very honest about the fact that those things are lacking in there. Um, and so I think that's the best of everything because they understand there's a lot of different ways to skin the cat, but uh, they, they want to put pressure on you and see how you respond to that. Yeah. Yeah. No, that makes sense. That makes sense. Yeah. And that I, 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 like I said, I've been in different situations where other people have, have, um, you know, I, I've seen other people come in and, you know, again, they come in for a day and they, you know, create this whole report, this whole grandiose thing, but the, the, they don't have any context behind it. It's just their opinion, the, their lens, their view. And it's like, okay, you know, but you don't know this, this, and this happened behind that. So I just was curious you know, uh, how, how you guys uh, establish and handle, you know, those types of situations. So that, that makes sense. Um, what, so with, with the book launch, what, um, what are you looking to accomplish with the book launch? What, what's the, uh, what's the goal with it? Would you say? Well, I think that there's uh, there's two sides of uh, a mountain of people that are ascending. You have your service providers, you know, the rich are getting richer and there's more and more people that are that are doing work and service to those ultra high net worth people. Mm -hmm. And I think for them, I want to demystify. This is how you do it. It's actually, you know, a process that can be systematized and it can make sense to you in a way that can help you and your business to flourish. Mm -hmm. And then I think for the ultra high net worth, I think that a lot of them become super wealthy in a pretty quick fashion. We have a lot of clients that, you know, five years ago uh, didn't have a family office, weren't billionaires, and now they have all of those things. Yeah. And I think there can be a presumption, oh, if you have all of those things, then you have these great systems and these great processes that are worked out. And it's almost exactly the opposite. It's, it's usually... Uh, people that are uh, kind of cobbled together. And a lot of them actually don't even have assistants anymore. They kind of use Sportus as their assistant. And so what we're trying to tell them is, you know, you can actually use this as a guide for your support staff mm -hmm. so that you can get more of the things that, that give you what you want. Um, it's, it's 20 years of trial and error. And, uh, and I think it's, uh, it's useful for, for both those groups. Yeah, that's interesting. And would, would it be fair to say too that, you, um, someone else could be using this who might not even be necessarily 
uh, targeting high net worth individuals, but I mean, everyone likes to be served well, right? So, you know, you, you, you can also, you know, have a, you know, a local, you know, city company or something like that, that's just serving, you know, local people. Um, and again, would your book help identify, you know, this is the way that you should be treating people or, or, you know, this is the way that, that you should handle these different situations. Exactly. Yes. I, I think, you know, you don't necessarily have to be targeting the top 0.01% for these principles to help your business. And I think as you ascend uh, the, the skyscraper and you start doing more and more value creation with your business, you have more freedom to determine where you want it to go. And I think that's what most <clears throat> entrepreneurs are looking for. Yeah, no, I love that. I love that. Um, if, if people want to learn more about Fortis or the book, and actually, where, where is the book going to be uh, located at? Is it going to be on Amazon everywhere? or? Yes, it's on Amazon and, and everywhere else, I'm told. Uh, but what rich clients want is now on Audible, Kindle, uh, paperback, and hardcover. And then Fortis uh, is uh, Fortis.co, C-O, is our, is our homepage. And then my personal author page is uh, NathanFoy.com. Love it. Love it. Nathan, this is fantastic. Uh, I'm going to run out and grab a copy of the book myself and, and start uh, digesting that and hopefully integrating quite a few different strategies that you've tested over the years. So uh, this has been great. Excellent. Yeah. Well, it's been, uh, it's been great talking to you, Matt. I appreciate you having me. No problem.